Okay, welcome to the first review session on genetics. Um, I threw some words up here that are kind of important for you, like homozygous, heterozygous, allele, recessive, dominant, carrier. All these things are terms that you definitely need to know, and the AP expects that you know those right off the get-go. Um, I think the only one that sometimes tricks up people is the carrier component. So remember, carrier is that uh, you don't express maybe what the disease is, but you're carrying the allele that is... Uh, for the disease, um, heterozygous, homozygous, we're talking about whether or not the alleles are the same for the individual. So let me say homozygous, same type of allele, and heterozygous being different type of allele. Um, and dominant recessive, that was that Mendelian genetics that the dominant will o mask over the recessive. Okay, so law of independent assortment and law of segregation. are some of the first laws that are applied to Mendelian genetics and we'll talk about law of segregation first. This is simply saying that when those homologous pairs like the ones that are drawn up here line up in the metaphase plate <clears throat> and they proceed to anaphase one chromosome moves one way and one chromosome moves the other way on both sets and that the gametes that result will only get half the information that they should have if they were doing mitosis. Right? We want the gametes to be haploid, not diploid. The other one is uh, the law of independent assortment. And what law of independent assortment is, is that these homologous pairs can line up as it's being shown right now, or they can be flip-flopped where the black one is on the left-hand side for both, or, like I said, you have it this way. Regardless of how it lines up, these are differences in the formation of gametes, which results in more diversity for the organism. But this is the law of independent assortment, that this pair here, down here, is not connected to the pair that's above. So this black one here, just because it's on the left-hand side, doesn't mean this black chromosome has to be on the left-hand side. Um, and that is when they line up. Now, if the law of segregation is violated, and we have one chromosome going one way, and this chromosome ends up going the same way, we're going to have the wrong amount of chromosomes in the gametes. This chromosome or this gamete over here on the left hand side will end up having three chromosomes in it instead of two. So this would be an N plus one gamete. And this one over here will be N minus one gamete. Now, violations of the law of segregation can happen in two places. It can happen in meiosis one or it can happen in meiosis two. If it happens in meiosis one, meiosis one violation, you're going to get N plus one, N plus one, N minus one, and N minus one for your gamete results because we made the mistake early on. And if we do an error in meiosis two, you're going to have N plus one, N minus one, N and N because that first division happened fine. But then one of the sides uh, divided inappropriately, and in turn, you get more chromosomes than you're supposed to get in the cells. So that's the violation of law of segregation, uh, also known as non-disjunction, which we'll talk about some of those diseases in the second review session that comes later. Okay, so inheritance patterns, non-Mendelian. We're looking at different examples here. The first one is showing you a flower that has both red and white in it. So this would probably come from a cross where you have red crossed with white. And now we end up seeing the heterozygote, right, being big R, little r. Can't see that R because it blended into the picture. Big R, little r is both white and red. So is this incomplete or is this co-dominant? This is where students get hung up. Um, it is co-dominant. The way I like to remember it is co, like cooperating. Uh, if you're cooperating with somebody, both of you are uh, giving information to the conversation, just like both of these are contributing to the color of their child, their offspring. You see red and white in the offspring. Just like if there's a presentation and you're both cooperating or making that presentation, you are both putting input into that presentation. The difference here between co-dominant and the one below, which is incomplete dominant, we don't see both red and white in the heterozygote. We see a blending between the two, and that is incomplete dominance. 
incomplete. Right, incomplete meaning we're not quite one way or the other, we're in between the two. So in between or incomplete, we're halfway in between or we blended between the two. So we're not quite red and we're not quite white, we're in between. But that would be the heterozygote as well. And notice that in codominant or incomplete dominance, you're gonna see the one to two to one for phenotypic ratios, whereas if it was a complete dominance, it would have been a three to one ratio. All right, so that's a big one, and that shows up on tests. Which one of the following crosses would cause a one to two to one uh, result in the phenotype ratio, and codominance and incomplete dominance would be your answers for that. Okay, come back to the crosses in a second. Here we have polygenic and pleiotropic. In polygenic, I know this is left over. Sorry, I was practicing beforehand. Um, in polygenic, we end up having uh, many genes contributing to one effect, right? So th that's what the green bubbles are showing. The green bubbles are showing all the different genes, like it says over here, contributing to one trait or one phenotype. So we're talking about things like height of a human, skin color, right? Eye color. Something where you see a lot of variety in that phenotype when you're observing it among a population is probably going to be polygenic. And there's a lot of genes in humans that work this way. And in turn, you end up seeing, if we're looking at distribution of the traits, you're going to see somewhat of a bell-shaped type of curve. But it doesn't always have to be that way. We'll talk when we get to evolution unit. It really depends on what is more beneficial for the environment. So here we're seeing uh, a variety, if we're talking about human height, that there's a lot of individuals at this median height, and there's some that are taller, and there's some that are smaller. But for the most part, we're, we're seeing a large variety of the individuals at the median, right? Um, the opposite is pleiotropic, where we have one gene causing lots of effects to the organism, right? So something like sickle cell anemia would be a pleiotropic effect where we end up having just one change in a gene causing the red blood cells to change which causes issues with uh, the heart and the liver and the muscle tissues of that individual so we're getting one gene change tons of different effects okay. the next one here is showing you uh, epistasis and in epistasis what we're seeing is one gene affecting the outcome of another gene's uh, information. So what I've shown in the picture, I don't know if you're seeing what this is, but we've got light bulbs. We've got a green light bulb and a blue light bulb. If you have the capital B, you get a green light bulb. If you have the lowercase b, you get a blue light bulb. But the question is, is the light switch turned on? So if you have a big C, you get power turned on. If you have a little C, two little Cs, your power is off. So it doesn't matter what light bulb you plug into the outlet, the other gene affects whether or not it shows up. So you're seeing all the ones in the top half of the Punnett square here and off to the left have not only the color gene, but they also have the distribution of whether that color gets put into the fur. So all those individuals have big C or at least one big C uh, so that their power is turned on. Whereas all the ones in the bottom right where it's albino, we have little c's, meaning that that melanin never gets distributed to the hair, and in turn, they are albino. And this happens all across the animal kingdom, where we end up getting albinism, not only just in humans or uh, rats, but we get them in you know, birds and snakes and all kinds of fish, different organisms that live on this planet. And it's all because of this epistatic type of event. Okay, let's go back to our Punnett square then, and being able to do this. At this point in the presentation, if you would like to pause it and see if you can do this by yourself before you listen to me give you the answer, that would probably be beneficial to you because you'll see these types of things on the test. Okay, unpaused, and here we go. So we have a cross here where we're saying heterozygous for all traits. So that would be <clears throat> big R, little r, big T, little t, uh, big A, little a, big Q, little q crossed with an individual that is heterozygous for uh, the first trait, so red, so we got big R, little r, but then they are short, so that's little t, little t, 
and then they are not awesome, so that's little a, little a, and then they are heterozygous for q, quick, so that's big Q, little q. So first thing you need to do is set up separate Punnett squares for each one of these. So I'm going to do these in separate colors. So you've got big R, little r, big R, little r, big R, big R, big R, little r, big R, little r, little r, little r. And then you've got the T's. And in this scenario, we've got big T, little t, but we've got little t, little t for the other parents. Right? And then we go to the A's, and once again, we've got big A, little a for one parent, but little a, little a for the other parent. And then the last one is the Q's, and that's heterozygous in both traits. So we go big Q, little Q, big Q, little Q, capital Q, capital Q, lowercase, capital lowercase, lowercase, lowercase. All right, so for the first part of the problem we're looking for, red, tall, short, quick. So I like to circle out on the Punnett squares what codes for those different things. So for the first one here, we have red, so that would be all three of these. So we get three quarters for that event. Right, so we're adding up all the genotypes that would code for the same phenotype, so that's a rule of addition. And on the second one, tall. Uh, these two are tall, so that's two out of four that are tall. And we're going to end up multiplying those together because those are separate events. Then we're looking for short in the next one. So little a, little a is the short one. Two out of four on that. And then the last one is quick. And for quick, you only get this one. So we have four separate events. All you have to do is multiply all those together. So 3 times 2 times 2. So we got 6 and 12 as the numerator. And the denominator, 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, um, which comes up with a fairly large number, like in the realm of 156 or something of that nature. I'm not going to do the math. Uh, and then how many will turn out for the second part? Big R, little r, big T, little t, little a, little a, little q, little q. All you do is same thing. So we're just going to do... Big R, big R, so that's 2 out of 4. Uh, big T, little t, so once again, 2 out of 4 for that one. And then little a, little a, 2 out of 4 for that one. And little q, little q, 1 out of 4. So slightly different answer because we're not taking into account that big R, big R for that first one. All you do, once again, multiply that out, and that would be your answer. That's as complex as the Punnett squares will become. Uh, you'll probably have to do one where you're looking for a phenotype like this, and you'll have to do one where you're looking for a genotype like that, if not more than just one. Okay. All right, so the next part, uh, what if we have scenarios where it's sex-linked? Well, sex-linked plays a different part. So with sex-linked, you're going to have to not only look at whether it's dominant or recessive, but you have to take into account that boys have XY and girls are XX. So... It's not supposed to be a Q. Um, so with XY, the Ys, as you remember in class, really have nothing on them other than this gene called the SRY, which is the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome. Uh, everything else is ca carried on the X chromosome. So if we're talking about uh, colorblind vision, colorblind is a recessive disease. So in a male, all they have to do is get one lowercase r and they get color blindness. The female has to get two lowercase r's to have color blindness. So in this problem, we're saying two parents have normal vision and they have a color blind son. So how would this look? We'll, we'll do a real quick pedigree show out as well because you're going to have to know these as we continue. So the son is all colored in. He has the disease, which means he's x little r y, right? He is not x little r y little r. That's, that's a mistake. It, y doesn't carry really anything on it, so we're not going to put letters on top of it. The female has normal vision, so she's x, x, and she at least has one big R. Dad has normal vision as well. Dad has to have a big R to have normal vision. Once again, nothing on the Y chromosome. So the question becomes, well, what's mom's genotype? Is she big R, big R, or is she big R, little r? Well, if you understand that half information comes from one parent, and half information comes from another parent. This son right here had to get his little rx from mom, which means she is heterozygous for colorblind vision. The y has to come from dad. If dad gave his big r, 
it would not be a square, it would be a circle. Okay. With that being said, girls are not doubly awesome because they have two X chromosomes. I'm sorry, girls. Um, you're awesome and everything, but not because you have two X chromosomes. Uh, because what happens is in the egg, the X, one X came from dad and one X came from mom, and it has information on it. Um, what's going to happen is as this egg starts dividing into lots of cells, these cells can actually change which X is going to be expressed. Because in some of them, we'll put this as a red and this one as a green, right? Some of them, one of the X's will show up and some of them, the other X will show up. And the reason that this happens is because we get X inactivation. And when you have X inactivation, one of these X's here will curl up and turn into like a black dot inside the cell. And when it does that, that's called a bar body. So the only individuals that can get bar bodies are females, unless they have a genetic mutation where they end up having two X's and a Y. So this would kind of be like a boy, but it has two X's. So this individual, which we'll talk about this disease later, if you know it right now, hopefully you do, it's called Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, they would actually have bar bodies as well. Okay, but they're infertile, so they don't produce offspring. All right, so the last picture then, we're looking at a karyotype. Uh, and this karyotype is going to be seen uh, in multiple sections of uh, your understanding of this unit. Not only do you have to understand that it, you can determine the sex of the individual, uh, but you should be able to determine diseases as well. Not necessarily something where it's a single gene thing like Tay-Sachs or... Um, say PKU or sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis or any of those type of things, but full chromosome mutations you should be able to pick up from these uh, images. So you look at this and we see pairs matched up. Every diploid organism should have two chromosomes per type. And as you can see, the banding patterns are pretty much the same. They're about the same length. So you look along every single pair and do they have two? Looks like it until you get down here, right? Like, oh, that last one, that's not right. That's not a pair. They have a genetic disease. Yes, they do. That genetic disease is that they're a man. So what that means is they have selective hearing, right? So that's the disease they'll end up getting. But this is a boy because it has X and a Y, right? If it was two of the exact same size, then it would be a girl. If we ended up having three on the 21st chromosome, one right here, we would have Down syndrome. So the AP expects you to be able to look at a picture like this and real quickly be able to say if it's a normal male, a normal female, or if that individual has a trisomy of some sort. Trisomy meaning they have three of one type or if they have one of one type. So the only trisomy or monosomy that really happens is if we have no X chromosome, but we only have or no Y chromosome, but we have one X chromosome and that would be Turner syndrome. Right? We'll talk later about Klinefelter's and uh, some of the other ones that go with uh, sex chromosome non-disjunction disorders. But remember, the way that they get more chromosomes is because there's a failure in meiosis, right? Whether it be meiosis one or meiosis two is gonna gauge how that mutation or that non-disjunction event uh, turns out in the gametes. And this wraps up our first review session for genetics. Look in the second one for pedigrees, diseases, and gene mapping. I believe those are the three big things that go with that. If you have any other questions or you need more help on any of these different types of concepts, uh, please email us and we'll try to give you some more sample questions. Have a good rest of your night.